Okay, I'm going to go through the problem set. I've got to apologize. My um, iPad pen died, so I'm using inferior technology, and it's going to be a little crude here. Um, but let's talk these through. 1A went fine. Um, one thing I want you to notice is you really got to keep track of the absolute values. Uh, this here, um, let's just do it all by itself, is positive. Square root of A plus square root of B is positive. You don't have to worry there. But you're, both A minus B and square root of A minus square root of B need to be in absolute values for all of this to make sense. Um, second one. I don't need to go through again. That all worked fine. Again, you write a minus b as the square root of a minus square root of b times square root of a plus square root of b. You divide through, and you notice that square root of a over square root of a plus square root of b is necessarily less than 1. People did fine on c, but you missed some. most people missed something important. I said use the previous part, renaming variables as befits your needs. So here, you already proved in B uh, Oh, actually, I think um, to make this work out right, xn has to equal B, x has to equal A, and epsilon has to equal E, and you probably have to notice that xn minus x in absolute value is the same as x minus xn. Done, right? You don't have to reprove it because you already proved it. You just reference it. Okay. Um, uh, we are proving in D, this is one that people um, struggled with, we are proving that the limit as n approaches infinity of the square root of xn equals square root of x. So that means we're going to start with let epsilon be greater than 0. We have to define k. We have to let n be greater than 0. It can be greater than, sorry, k. And the last line is this. How are we going to get this? Of course, we use 1D. So we can see that this all works if we can get to the step xn minus x is less than epsilon times the square root of x. How do you do that? You do that using the definition of limit. Okay? We don't know what xn is. It's not n. You can't just solve for n when you've got xn. The only thing you can do to make this happen is use the fact that we have that the limit of xn approaches x. So here's how that looks. Oops, sorry. Let epsilon be greater than zero. Choose k so that if n is greater than k and is a natural number, then xn minus x is less than epsilon square root of x because xn approaches x, right? The fact that xn approaches x means that whatever you put in for epsilon, there is a k after which the sequence is within that distance, okay? So now we just follow our nose. Let n be greater than k. What does that tell you? Just what we wrote down, that xn minus x is less than epsilon over square root of x. What does that tell you? By 1d, by 1c, that tells you square root of xn minus square root of x, absolute value is less than epsilon. Done. Nothing else is needed. Okay. But the key step is using the limit of one thing to prove the limit of another. Okay, this went quite well. Um, people, if, if anybody had a problem with this, it was an algebra mistake. I won't go through it. Um, this one people understood but had trouble 
expressing. Um, we needed three things. Um, oops, I don't know why I keep forgetting. Monotone, that's easiest, most easily expressed by the recursive definition. xn plus 1 is equal to xn plus 1 over 2 to the n plus 1, which is 1 over 2 to the n, which is positive, and is therefore greater than xn. That's much simpler than using the formula 2 minus 1 over 2 to the n. Um, bounded. That's much easier using the formula. One over two to the n is positive, so it's two minus one over two to the n is less than two. Done. Doesn't matter whether or not xn is converging to two. That doesn't help it be bounded by two. But this particular fact, that it's two minus a positive quantity, is the bound. Okay? And then converges. That one definitely... uses um, the sum rule. You can break the limit up. The limit of a constant 2 is obviously 2. The limit of 1 over 2 to the n is obviously 0. So this limit is 2. Okay. We didn't need the bounded monotone, right? It, we're, we're able to prove its convergence directly. The bounded and monotone was just to practice so that later on, you'd have a sense of how to prove bounded and monotone. Okay, um, here's one with people, people really struggled with. Um, I really want you to read this sentence and understand it. I gave you um, a hint about what was hard and how to solve it. No, almost no one tried to use the hint. There's another way you can do it. One or two people tried to do it the other way and came pretty close to succeeding. Um, but the vast majority of people, when faced with the fact that they didn't understand what my hint said and I came as close as I could to coming to your dorm room, getting on my knees and begging you to ask me a question, were unwilling to ask me a question. So I want you to think about what stopped you from asking. If it is, I didn't get to this until midnight before it was due, then you want to start sooner so that you can ask me a question. If it was some sort of terror that it was a stupid question, um, that's ridiculous. All questions are a little bit stupid. You can't ever do anything in mathematics if you're not willing to be a little bit stupid. Um, in this case, questions about what this means is a really smart question. But regardless, if you don't understand something, you got to ask. Okay, so let's take a look at this. Um, remember, yn is the sum. 1 plus... Zero factorial is one, one factorial is one, two factorial is two, three factorial is six, four factorial. Xn is one over two to the zero, plus one over two to the one, plus one over two to the two, plus one over two to the th um, three, plus one over two to the fourth. <laughs> um, you can see that if you compare it term by term, uh, mostly the yn's are bigger. If you, um, I'm sorry, um, if you compare it term by term, sometimes the yn's are bigger and smaller, mostly, but sometimes they're bigger, which means that, well, eventually, um, 
Uh, I'm sorry, which means that it is almost never true that yn is less than or equal to xn. So if that's what you're trying to prove, it won't work. It is also not true at first that 1 over, um, 1 over n factorial is less than or equal to 1 over 2 to the n. Um, let's see, when n is 2, that's true. When n is 3, um, that's true. But it's not true for 0 or 1. Um, I guess it is true for 0. It's not true for 1. Um, so, uh, I'm sorry, I just got myself muddled. muddled. Um, 1 over 2 fact, um, 1 over n factorial becomes less than 1 over 2 to the n only at n equals 4 and higher, right? It takes a while for the fact 1 over n factorial to get smaller. So if you're trying to prove this by induction, it's false unless you make this assumption. One way to approach this problem is to observe that that's true, to prove that um, yn is less than or equal to 1 plus xn for n equals 0, 1, 2, and 3, and then, then use induction to prove it's true for everything greater than or equal to 4. That works. It's not very aesthetically pleasing. It's a little confusing. It might be the simplest way to do it. Instead, what I recommended doing um, was noting that um, if you skip a term, then the thing you're adding to yn is always smaller, less than or equal to the thing you're adding to xn. Okay? Um, so that amounts to observing that um, if you leave off the first term, um, then um, then yn minus 1 is less than xn minus 1. So that's yn minus 1 is the sum without the first term, so starting at 1. xn minus 1 starts at 0 and only goes to up to n minus 1. These two things have the same number of terms in it, and each one is term by term smaller. So this is done by induction. And the easiest way to do that is to first notice that um, xn minus 1, which is the sum from k equals 0 to n minus 1 of 1 over 2 to the k, is the same thing as if you write out the first few terms of this you see these are the same sum okay right when k equals zero this is one when k equals one it's one half the very last term is two to the n minus one over here, when k equals 1, 1 over 2 to the k minus 1 is 1. The last term is 1 over 2 to the n minus 1. These are the same sum because we have shifted the index. Everywhere k goes from 0 to n minus 1, we're going to shift it up 1. It goes from 1 to n, and then 1 over 2 to the k then becomes 1 over 2 to the k minus 1. This is like a u substitution in the sum. 
Um, it's a common thing to do with sums and very important and powerful. So then it is easy to prove by induction that um, y to the n minus 1, which is the sum from k equals 1 to infinity, I'm sorry, 1 to n of 1 over k factorial is less than or equal to xn minus 1, which is the sum k equals 1 to n of 1 over 2 to the k minus 1, because the thing you wanted to prove is, once you've shifted the variable, is now true. 1 over k factorial is less than or equal to 1 over 2 to the k minus 1. That induction works well, and then you just have to notice, so yn is less than or equal to 1 plus xn minus 1, and xn is increasing. Okay. So it was a tricky problem, and um, you really needed to grapple with the hint. Okay. And then finally, to show that yn is convergent, um, we're going to use bounded monotone convergence. Um, yn is increasing because yn plus 1 is less than or equal to, I'm sorry, is equal to yn plus 1 over n, fact, n plus 1 factorial, which is positive, so that's greater than or equal to yn. yn is bounded, because yn less than or equal to 1 plus xn, which is less than or equal to 3 minus 1 over 2 to the n, which is less than or equal to 3. Okay? Perfectly good bound. So, yn converges. That's all you need. Okay, question three. Um, let's do our um, scratch paper. We need n over n plus one minus m over m plus one is less than epsilon. You can't, it is true that it would suffice to make this be true. But we're never gonna be able to make this true because these quantities, when n is big and m is big, are close to one. Whereas epsilon, we're thinking of as going to zero. But in any case, this needs to work when epsilon is small. Never gonna work, okay? So that, is not going to work. Instead, we simplify. Um, common denominators, people were fine with this. Um, when you multiply it out, the nms cancel, so you're left with n minus m on top over n plus 1, m plus 1, now, if you break it up, you can see each of these we can make small, right? n over n plus 1 is less than 1, so this whole thing looks like 1 over n plus 1. You can make those as small as you want. So you're going to want to make 1 over n plus 1 less than epsilon, 1 over n plus 1 less than epsilon, and life is a little easier if you get rid of that plus 1, replace m, 1 over n plus 1 with something a little bigger, that's still going to zero, because then, oops, these are over two. Because then you just need m and n to be bigger than two over epsilon. So here comes the proof. 
I'm really working at doing my scratch paper on a separate sheet of paper and making the argument from here on in, I am going to look at, I'm going to want to see your scratch paper not there or way off to the side, unambiguously separated from your argument. And when I look at your argument, if you say something that's not justified by what came before, I am going to take off for it. Um, so if you want to have your scratch paper to the side so I can figure out what your thinking was if it was a mistake, that might be helpful, but your argument needs to stand alone. Um, so here we let epsilon be greater than zero and define k to be two over epsilon. We're gonna let n m be greater than k. So we get one over n plus one is less than epsilon over two. 1 over n plus 1 is less than epsilon over 2. <clears throat> and then we find that 1 over n plus 1 minus 1 over n plus 1 is um, less than, absolute value is less than epsilon. Not quite what we wanted, but actually quite close. Um, if we combine these, n plus 1 times n plus 1, um, I'm sorry, n plus 1 minus n plus 1, Actually, I think the easiest thing to do that many people did is add and subtract 1. And then this just becomes n over n plus 1 minus m over n plus 1. Is less than epsilon, and then we're done. Okay. Um, really important that you not refer back to your, you know, this algebra is kind of annoying, but you really need to repeat it because in arguing backwards, we were replacing small things with bigger things, and the logic can get really confused unless you're very careful that each step here follows from what came before. Okay, finally, question four. Um, we're going to use facts about the sequence Xn to prove the same fact about the sequence Axn. Um, so let's see, we want... Um, We want AXN in order to make AXN minus AX be less than epsilon, we need to make XN minus X absolute value be less than epsilon over absolute value of a, but a is positive, okay? We can do that, right? We can choose k. So that if n and m are integers greater than k, um, then xn minus xm is less than epsilon over a because we can make it less than any quantity. That's our epsilon prime, if you like. And then let n, m be greater than k. So 
that is exactly what we need to say that xn minus xn is less than epsilon over a, axn minus axm is less than epsilon, since a is positive. Really want to check when you're multiplying through, dividing in an inequality, it's by a positive number. Lots of things go wrong if you don't, so it's really helpful say, if that's literally one of the assumptions, you ought to say it. Um, okay, and the next two are actually a little bit simpler. If xn is bounded, then um, we need... Um, that means that there is an m such that for all n xn is less than m. That's what it means to be bounded. What does that make? What's true about axn? Then, for all n, axn is less than or equal to absolute a times n, which is less than or equal to a times n, since a is positive. That's all you need. And then if xn is monotone, for all n, xn plus 1 is greater than xn. So for all n, axn plus 1 is greater than axn, since a is positive. So axn is increasing. Um, so, a couple of lessons to take away. I'm really going to be looking for arguing forwards for your proof to be a self-contained logical argument where each thing relies on the last. I am really going to be a stickler for your acknowledging each quantifier, for your introducing variables before they show up. If I look at a sentence, I will need it to make sense only using variables that have been introduced, I know what they are, and follow from what came before. And the other, other thing to keep track of is when you're using a given that has quantifiers in it, that has a universal statement, you get to, I'm sorry, an existential statement, you get to choose something that has that property. If there's a universal, you get to put that in however you want. It hands you back that K or that M or whatever Give it a name and use it. Um, get used to that structure. Okay, that is the problem set.